Hello, everybody. My name is Carrie Ciro. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. I am located at the University of Oklahoma Health Sciences Center in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. And if you don't know where that is, I've put a little detail on the map so you can find us in the United States. So what I'm really talking about today are, is a problem that all people with Alzheimer's disease or related dementias have, and that is that they eventually lose the capacity to do the things they need and want to do. In occupational therapy, we call those the occupations of daily life. So whether it's cooking, talking on the phone, or uh, playing with grandkids, they all have some level of deficits in some of these areas. And unfortunately, we really lack standardized rehabilitation interventions that are specific to occupations or the daily activities of people, particularly in the area of not only improving skill sets, but also delaying decline uh, in those skill sets. So just as for a little bit of background, um, uh, when we think about uh, Alzheimer's disease and related dementias, of course, we think about uh, memory loss. And when we think about long-term memory uh, for things like, oh, I'm sorry. sorry we, you, are, you are not moving your slides, oh, I think. okay. Okay, thank you. Let me try to fix that. If I do that, are they moving? Yes. yes. Okay, great, thank you. So when we think about uh, things like long-term memory in particular, we have, uh, we can grossly categorize that by declarative memory and procedural memory. We know that declarative memory for things like facts, uh, names, that those things go fairly quickly and early in Alzheimer's disease. When we talk about procedural memory for doing day-to-day -day tasks, that those seem to be uh, less affected early on and more affected in the later stages. So procedural memory might be how do you get up and walk somewhere or how do you put on your shoes or how do you feed yourself. So if you kind of take a look at where the brain is impaired at which stages or what, excuse me, what areas of the brain are uh, really control different types of memory. This uh, first brain on the top left really shows you the areas of the brain that are highly in control of declarative memory. Um, and so you can see it's, it includes uh, cortical and subcortical structures. And if you look at a side-by-side -side of a brain that's impaired by Alzheimer's disease, you certainly will see similarities in areas um, across those two pictures. If, however, you look at areas that are largely, that largely control um, procedural memories, and that would be the areas in green, you can see that you see that there's largely could be a sparing of that in Alzheimer's disease. So that could be an important strength for us to rely on in training of people with Alzheimer's disease because uh, procedural memory is really based on task specific training and it's fulfilled by the basal ganglia and the cerebellum, which are relatively spared in early to moderate Alzheimer's disease. So any strengths that we can pull upon is important for us to do. So the conceptual model for my intervention um, is that procedural memory is the memory we rely on for daily performance of ADL. It also includes uh, the, the memory for things like routines, which are ADL tasks sequenced together. So routines are things like what you do, for example, in the morning to get ready. You get up, you go to the bathroom, you brush your teeth, you take a shower. So that sequencing of daily activities are, are what called routines, and those rely largely on procedural memory. Um, any new skills that we learn or any skills that we have that, are, that we uh, do on a daily basis are uh, controlled through procedural memory. And we learn those through physical practice, which is largely a function of basal ganglia, the basal ganglia. So if you think about like how long it took your, how many times did your kids have to practice tying their shoes before they could tie their shoes? It takes a lot of practice to get to physical uh, independence. And uh, when we were developing the intervention, we used treatment strategies that, we, we, that were known to enhance basal ganglia excitement and 
uh, also address any psychological contributors like depression or motivation and came up with a model called uh, skill building through task oriented motor practice or stomp so if we look at the procedural or excuse me the conceptual model we see that it starts with procedural memory underlying adl and then we strengthen procedural memory uh, for ADL through task-oriented training in a natural environment. So we've done studies in the clinic, but we've also done studies in the home environment. Uh, we did, uh, again, we uh, aligned our treatment intervention with what we knew about how people learn best when they have cognitive uh, impairment. One of those ways is blocking the practice so that you cop that you practice the same steps the same way every time with little variation. We also employed errorless learning so they were learning without error. So we did lots of hand over hand training um, and uh, made sure we were positioned our bodies in ways that we could uh, uh, do their training in a way that that move them forward without making errors. Uh, the basal ganglia evidently really likes immediate and positive verbal praise. There are studies where it lights up like a firecracker whenever uh, during training you're actually talking positively. Um, we also uh, engaged the training around family-centered goals and coaching. So we would talk with the families and we would talk with the patients about the goals that were most important to them. And we know that when you think about neuroplasticity, um, the meaningfulness of an activity is really important for learning. And then we engaged what I think was probably the most uh, unique element to uh, dementia intervention, which was extremely high repetition. We see these in stroke studies where they really try to elevate the amount of dosing uh, to obtain neuroplasticity for um, people post-stroke. So this was really the first time that we know of that we uh, were able to implement that. All of these strategies are um, embedded in an intentional relationship with the, with the client. So we spent time getting to know them, uh, time getting them to trust us. Um, and so they, we felt like uh, we feel like that is a huge part of any type of training regimen. And that all these things ultimately in our conceptual model lead to facilitation of cortical striatal plasticity um, for procedural memory, um, which improves ADL performance and may um, prevent some decline. So uh, in our earlier work, we've already established feasibility in patient and caregiver tolerance. We established efficacy in the home and the clinical environments. And we did those using a fairly intensive protocol, which I'll explain in a minute. In this study, um, we were looking at, are there advantages to learning or retention of learning uh, through using the intensive protocol we were using versus a less intensive protocol. So what I'm really showing you today is a dosing study. And we really hypothesized that uh, people would have significantly higher scores in activities of daily living post intervention and then better uh, retention at the 90 day follow up if they had the higher or the, the highest intensity dosage of stomp. So basically, uh, the, the protocol looked like this. We did baseline uh, uh, measures that I'll explain in a minute for three different goals that were most meaningful to them. In the high intensity group, which is the group we've done the most study on, we were doing three hours a day, five days a week for two weeks. And in each hour of that day, we were focused on one goal. So if they had brushing your teeth, uh, managing going to the bathroom on your own, and uh, making a sandwich, we would do each of those goals for, for an hour a day. In the low intensity group, we did one hour a day, two days a week for two weeks. We picked that model because that would be a typical model for like a home health occupational therapist that might come in and just try to improve function through uh, those means. So you can see there's quite a bit of difference in the dosing. We've got 30 hours versus 40 hours overall if they uh, complete the entire uh, study. So with this dosing, we did a two week intervention. Uh, the entire time we were monitoring uh, behavioral episodes, 
uh, the amount of time they spent on task and the number of repetitions they did for each activity. Then we did post-intervention uh, outcome measures and then uh, we did 90-day uh, outcome measures. So after the two-week intervention, we did not see them anymore. We did ask them to continue practicing at least at the time they did something. So if uh, one of their goals was brushing their teeth, we'd ask them to brush their teeth the way they learned how to do it in the intervention. It's not that they had to continue with uh, the high dosage. So uh, further methodology is the evaluator was a licensed occupational therapist and the interventionist was a licensed uh, occupational therapy assistant for both groups. And then we had a blind evaluator at the doctoral level for uh, measuring post-intervention and 90-day follow-ups. So the protocol for STOMP is, is uh, fairly straightforward. We have a standardized evaluation where we talk to the patients about what their individual goals are, and we try to have them think about goals that would actually emphasize quality of life. And then we take a look at examiner ratings of performance in those goal areas and caregiver ratings of performance in those goal areas. So we see examiner ratings of performance and caregiver ratings of performance as two separate and distinct uh, variables. And so it was kind of interesting to, for us to kind of see how those uh, might uh, turn out together. Then once we've done that, we actually, um, you know, obviously as part of the evaluation, we are watching them do those three goals and we watch for where the errors occur. And so we not only watch for the errors occur, but we look at the steps that they go through to do the task. So in planning the intervention, we take that real life goal, break it down into practicable steps, and then we put in compensatory modifications like either uh, adapting the environment or using some type of cognitive strategy or some kind of task modification. Uh, so for example, uh, if we had somebody who uh, wanted to learn how or wanted to be able to continue to use their cell phone, for example, um, some compensatory modifications we might put in is uh, making sure they're in a quiet environment for environment. Uh, cognitive strategies might be uh, that um, they know that they always go to the red button to start the phone, like somehow start red or something, some mnemonic which helps them remember uh, how to start the task. And then for task modification, uh, we use things like uh, photo phones where the picture of somebody's child is what's on the uh, actual phone itself. And so you can actually just push that picture and make the phone call rather than having to actual dial the number. So we, we just did it, we made modifications based on however they presented to us, what were the areas of concern, and then uh, we kind of worked from there. Then, so that's kind of the planning, and then we go into implementation and training. So the training was this repetitive blocked practice. So literally, if making a cell phone call was the goal, we literally practiced that goal over and over again depending on the dosage group they were in. So if they were in a, a high intense group, they were practicing making a phone call for an hour. So they might've got, let's say 50 repetitions in. If they were in the low dosage group, they would practice that goal for 20 minutes and they might got, get 17 repetitions in. Uh, we did frequent verbal praise through each step. We did errorless learning and we did uh, all contextually appropriate environments. This time we were in the home and we used real life tools. We didn't use any um, simulated tools at all. And then of course, uh, throughout we established and maintained a therapeutic relationship. And one of the reasons we really wanted to put together a protocol like this is so that there would be an easy transfer to the clinical environment. So clinic, clinicians of course start with evaluation then they think about how they're gonna put the intervention together. And then there's actually this implementation piece. So that's why it was kind of uh, really structured and standardized in that way. However, what was built in was an individualization of this structure. So we could have, we had, uh, you know, 32 different people and they all had different goals. Um, so despite the fact that we have this uh, structured intervention, we still allowed for individuality uh, within the structure of our uh, uh, protocol. 
So one of the outcomes we used was an examiner rated performance, performance of the task. And we did this through goal attainment scaling. And basically this is a way to individually, uh, individually measure um, how somebody is performing uh, at the time of baseline and also that uh, uh, what they achieve in the end that allows you to compare people across a, or compare a large group of people that all have different goals. So for example, everyone, when we graded them, everyone started at baseline, which was this negative two score. And as you see, it comes up, as you see, it moves forward. If the outcome is somewhat less than expected, if the outcome is, uh, ex well, this is what we expected. And I should say that we had criteria around what was the expected outcome, like not moving more than two frames within a intervention. Um, if it was primarily physical and not uh, cognitive issues, they may be able to move more frames. So we set a goal of getting to zero uh, for any task that we chose, and then people either fell under that or they ex ex exceeded more than that. Um, and this has been a type of scale that's been um, seen as uh, reliable in people with dementia. The other scale that we used is the Canadian Occupational Performance Measure. This uh, is a can be a self-rated um, uh, measure of performance. Um, because we work with people that have memory problems, we did a caregiver rating of performance. So in this tool, um, which is kind of an interview that helped us prioritize the areas that were mo most important to them, you have the caregiver rate, what their performance is on the task on a scale of one to 10, where 10 is the worst, and, or excuse me, one is the worst and 10 is the best. And you also have them rate satisfaction with performance which is the same scale. So you can see, for example, here's some examples of the goals that people um, met or, or, or identified, and then examples of the scores that they may give prior uh, to beginning the intervention. So in our data analysis, we had 80% uh, had power to note difference um, within the uh, 32 per participants total. Um, we did repeated measures of ANOVA, um, and then pairwise testing across time points with two keys methods to adjust for multiple uh, comparisons. So if you look at the high intensive group versus the low intensive group, you see that, um, that there's no differences in the uh, typical sociodemographic characteristics that you uh, would wanna take a look at, including age. You see that the age is on the high 70s scale, that we had a fair number of uh, males, that we had a fair number, uh, a majority of white, um, a majority of our, our uh, clients had some post high school education, um, most of them were married. And then when you look at uh, the types of uh, dementias, the majority of them had Alzheimer's disease, but we didn't uh, make this specific to Alzheimer's disease because we're really interested in um, differential effects uh, amongst the different types of dementia. Uh, obviously, we're not able to tell in a scale or a study this small about differential effects, but we're trying to gather some emerging data on that. And then um, the MMSC scores did not differ between the groups. You see that they're both in the moderate range according to the mini mental test. So before I get too far into the results, I just kind of wanted to show you some of the things that might confound some of the things. One of the things that we looked at is the amount of time they spent on each goal per session. So uh, as I said, they had three different goals. Some of the data that I'm gonna show you is really uh, just for the sake of time relevant to goal one. If you look at goal one, remember they were able to practice that for 60 minutes at a time, yet the mean score or the mean amount of time in minutes is 27 minutes. And that's about 45% of the time that would be available to them. Um, and you can see that the standard deviation is kind of relatively wide compared to uh, the less intensive stop uh, which, were, as you can recall, was uh, they had one hour a day to practice that. So, uh, but each goal had 20 minutes. So they're getting almost 13 minutes out of the 20 minutes. So they're getting around 63% of their time. And so I think this is really important to point out because even though the dosages were really different, um, there are some, um, there, there, there's some interesting artifacts here in terms of the amount of time that they spend in practice. 
So if we just look at one of our primary um, our measures, which is the goal attainment scale, again, this is the scale that was the examiner rated scale. So this is the examiner looking at them doing those three goals. Um, so uh, the initial GAS score is the same for everybody. So there's no variability there. And as a reminder, uh, or as a, uh, to let you know that, remember I said that we set the score at zero, which in a T-score is the equivalent of 50. So if they get 50, that means they, would, they had met the goal. Anything over 50 would indicate exceeding the goal. So you can see post-intervention, um, they exceeded the goals that we set for them. Uh, unfortunately, not unfortunately, here's the science, there was no difference between the two dosing uh, groups for um, their ultimate outcomes. So then we, so, so it's saying that high dose and low dose, uh, as we've defined them here, uh, show a, a fairly similar outcomes. Um, there are some significant differences in the groups though between baseline and post-intervention. So obviously each group improves significantly. And then when you look at uh, post-intervention uh, compared to 90-day scores, they are also significantly different. And frankly, that's not an outcome we wanted. We wanted to show that there was, that the, the intervention would stick at 90 days. So um, you can kind of see the difference here. It's, it's uh, not a huge difference and it certainly uh, keeps them above baseline, uh, but there was regression to uh, the mean, but again, not below uh, baseline. And I just kind of want to just, it's kind of interesting to look at this uh, through a diagram. This is the same type of information for goal one, but you can see at baseline, there's kind of a strong steep uh, movement in a, in a positive direction. And then at post intervention to 90 day follow up, if they keep a straight line, that means they really retain the information. As you see the line goes down, you see that they have moved, um, uh, uh, they have regressed, but again, it's not to the, to the level of the mean. When you look at, and this was the intensive group, if you look at the less intensive group, you certainly see that same incline at the very beginning. Um, and then when you start looking at post-intervention and 90-day follow-up, there appears to be a trend of more decline instead of stabilization if you take a look at the two groups. And so I think that some of these things might really um, show themselves in a, in a larger study. If we look at those COPM scores, and those are the scores that our caregiver report, again, where one is the worst performance and 10 is the best performance. At baseline, both groups were in the area of around three to four. Post-intervention, they had moved into the sevens and eights. And I should say that for this scale, a clinically meaningful difference is moving two points. So they had a really strong improvement in terms of uh, caregiver uh, rated performance. Um, there was a significant difference between uh, baseline and post-intervention, so that's good. And um, when you look at the 90-day follow-up and you compare post-intervention to the 90-day follow-up, there was not a significant change in score, which is what we were hoping for, that there would be some um, um, sticking of the uh, intervention. Um, obviously, you can see in the, in the raw numbers that there's regression, but again, it's not to baseline and it's not a significant difference here. So again, if we kind of look at what this might look like graphically, we can see where people start at baseline, uh, where they, at post-intervention, there's certainly a rise. And then you see a lot of variation in either kind of staying the same um, or in some cases uh, improving over time uh, and in some cases decreasing over time. Now this scale has more uh, points on the scale, so you're gonna see more variability anyway. But if you compare the intensive stomp to the less intensive stomp, I think it's kind of uh, interesting to see that you see a trend of, of them declining more over time, it looks like, versus the uh, intensive stomp where you actually see uh, some people uh, continuing to improve over time. And I think another uh, piece that um, it's important to note here is that we also ask the caregivers uh, at the 90-day follow-up how much they continued to practice um, after the intervention because any intervention which requires behavioral change uh, we know that uh, 
that they can fall off pretty easily after a study is over. So it was really interesting for us to see how much uh, fall off there was. And so we just developed a pretty gross scale. We didn't want them to have these really intensive diaries that we felt like caregivers of people with dementia would not be able to complete. Um, but we did ask them things like, did you practice at all? you know, not at all. Did you practice one or two days a week or did you practice frequently, which we identify as three or more days a week? And I think it's very interesting to note that uh, there was a, a high degree of continuing to practice the, st practice the uh, stomp method even after it was over. And in most cases, 50% are over. And even when you look at a little, uh, those numbers uh, collectively are larger than um, not at all. So people really were, seem to be engaged in continuing to do at least some elements of uh, the intervention uh, after we left the homes. So what we think we found is that obviously there were no significant differences uh, between the groups in observed or reported ADL performance by dose. And some of that could be moderated by continuing practice post intervention, and also probably the amount of time on task. So even though we give an, an, give an hour to practice in those high dose uh, uh, sessions, they're not using that entire time. And in many cases, they're using less than half of that time. So we may not need that high of a dose in order to get obviously the effect we're looking for. Um, there was significant within group differences between baseline and post intervention. So we, we certainly see uh, where the intervention was effective for change. And then um, for it uh, kind of hanging on post intervention, uh, we saw significance in, uh, actually these are transverse. We saw significance in the COPM score and non-significance in the GAS score between post and 90 days. Um, but again, but not the below the goal level or the baseline level, which I still think tells us there's some element of this sticking or some element of this potentially uh, delaying some decline. Um, some of the strengths of the study were that it was a randomized control trial and it was in a natural environment with a lot of uh, distractions like grandkids and dogs and the phone ringing. And so you've got to know that if, if you can do an intervention in an environment like that and still get results, I think there's lots of promise there. Um, we used one blind evaluator across all the participants. Uh, we had two interventionists that, that we tested for their iterative reliability and that was very good. Um, some limitations for sure is that it's a small sample, but it was powered to detect the differences that we found. Um, unfortunately, quite highly educated and white, even though we made many attempts um, at recruiting um, non-whites, and I can discuss that with anybody of interest. And then the caregiver involvement was quite variable. We asked people to be there at least twice a week um, to learn how we were doing things, and um, we had a lot of variability in that. Some of the places I'd like to go next is, uh, is dosing dependent on cognitive level or type of dementia? Uh, we certainly know, we've already taken a look at this idea of do people with lower moderate dementia do worse than people with mild dementia? And the answer to that using this intervention has been no. And in fact, people with moderate dementia were more likely to uh, not be frustrated by the repetition. The people that were more cognitively aware were more frustrated with the repetition. So there may be some interesting mediation going on there. Um, I'm very interested in uh, priming the brain with physical activity before we start the intervention. A lot of the people that we saw in the home had been sitting in uh, recliners watching TV or did not have a lot of activity. And so I think that if we could have done something that would have really what we might call prime or energize the brain before we start might have uh, that might have an interesting effect as well and then there's uh, in stroke they spend a lot of time figuring out did the intervention cause uh, any physiological or structural changes before or after which really kind of gets to was there a neuroplastic response and that would be interesting for me to know as well given that that's part of the hypothesis that we have that um, there may be a neuroplastic process in play. So with that, I would just like to thank, uh, acknowledge the people that have helped me do this. Uh, and here is my email address should you want to contact me in the future.